thought I'd start by, is that too loud? All right, okay. I thought I'd start by kind of introducing myself. Um, my name's Tom Elegante, I'm pretty new to the scene. Um, last year was my first year at B-Sides, and I guess that I enjoyed it so much I thought I'd put together a little presentation this year. So, kind of, and you'll get an idea of where the term InfoSec Parenting come from, came, comes from. This is something uh, some of my coworkers and I have talked about over the past year. Uh, my background is primarily in the financial industry. Got 12 or 13 years in the financial industry. Uh, 10 of which has been in some sort of risk management function. It's been in operational risk, technology risk, security risk. So that's kind of where my talk is based, is a lot in risk management, and having those discussions with our business partners. To be perfectly honest, five, six years ago, I didn't even know security existed. Uh, back when I was getting my bachelor's and master's degree, you know, you'd go through a web programming class, maybe they'd talk about it, you know, you'd sit in a database admin class, maybe you'd talk about security, but it really wasn't a big thing as it is now. Um, so I really didn't even know that this field existed, but it's, I enjoy it, it's, it's a fun field, there's some challenges in it, but I enjoy the, the fact that we get a lot of opportunity to learn and to grow, uh, there's always something new, there's a lot of brilliant people in the industry that, to learn from. Uh, one of my favorite things about it is I enjoy kind of talking about what I do for a living because it, it's, it's fun to kind of solicit responses from people. This is, this is kind of what my grandma thinks I do, and that's a teller. Um, my grandma, bless her heart, uh, and which is fine. My son, of course, thinks I'm a security guard. This is what most friends and family think I do, and it's some kind of help desk, right? Of course, there's the, the portrayal of what media thinks we do. And then there's kind of that grim reality where we sit in a gray cubicle all day. But um, my limited exposure in security, there's a couple things that I've learned from sitting in conferences like this, talking to people. There's a couple challenges that I think we as, as security professionals face. And it's that, those challenges that I wanted to talk about today. So in addition to finance, I've spent some time in education, and I'm actually married to an educator, and so I've spent a lot of time talking about human development, child learning, child growth, that kind of stuff, um, and there's a bunch of theories out there, and it kind of depends on who you, what theory you pertain to, but they all kind of categorize child growth and child development into a bunch of different categories, and it's all based on kind of the cognitive learning cycle that children go through, and if you think about some of the children that are in the infancy and, and early stages, they don't really have a good understanding about the world around them. They don't really know much about, about the world around them. We as parents take care of them. We meet all their needs. They don't understand hot from cold, right? But as they progress, they learn more and more about the world around them. Then they become teenagers, right? And kind of that adolescent stage, they have a pretty good understanding of what's going on around them, but that brings some challenges, right? Because first of all, they get, kind of get that idea that they know everything, and so it's kind of a, a, a contentious conversation sometimes. The other challenge is, I, I, one of the things I enjoy is teaching youth uh, sports, especially uh, girls softball. I love coaching girls softball. It's, it's a lot of fun. Soccer's fun. There's a few other things, but if you've ever had the chance to talk to a teenager. I have been in conversations with my beautiful daughter at times where she has walked away and I've turned to my wife and asked my wife what she was talking about. So there's this communication gap that we, that we have. Now, sometimes in security I feel like we're parenting. I don't know if any of you have had kind of that similar feeling. Uh, I think a lot of the uh, quote from The Incredibles, if you remember back the early part of the movie, Mr. Incredible is kind of going through the reels and is being interviewed, and he says, you know, sometimes I feel like the maid in here, I just cleaned up. That's kind of how I sometimes feel as a security professional, right? You just address a vulnerability, take care of some security issue, and the next day there's something new. Well, I propose to you that our business partners, and I, I like to use the term business partners because that's what they are. We should have this partnership 
with the rest of the business. And, and that can be IT, it can be marketing, it could be uh, operations, it could be accounting, right? But we should have this partnership with them where we're working towards the same goal, where we're trying to accomplish the same thing. I think our business partners are a lot like teenagers, right? They have a pretty good understanding of the world around them. They have this, they have this general concept of technology, right? Our business partners, they all have smartphones, which have more power in them than, than uh, you know, a lot of the computers we grew up on. They have IoT devices, they all use Wi-Fi, they use Bluetooth, they have all these, this technology. So they have some basic understanding, and sometimes they think they know more than they do. But sometimes there's that communication gap when we're talking to our business partners. We don't always see things on the same level. They've got different goals than we do sometimes. So that's one of the challenges that we face. The other challenge that we face is that I think sometimes as, a, as security professionals, we tend to overreact. I've seen this a lot. A couple of my coworkers and I were talking today, and it happened in our organization just a couple days ago. So it happens quite a bit where we as security professionals tend to kind of freak out. I had, I had an old boss that used to call this the, uh, the knee-jerk reaction, right? We find a vulnerability and we kind of freak out. Now, there are times when that freak out is warranted, and there are times when it's not so much. The problem is it kind of develops that boy who cries wolf syndrome where we kind of lose some trust with our, with our business partners. And so we kind of build this wall and, and, and it kind of gives us a bad name. So over the next 15, 20 minutes, I want to talk about how I like to address these challenges, ways that we can work with our business partners to accomplish goals, to basically secure the organization. And the best way that I know to do that is through risk. And of course, my background's in risk management, so that's kind of where I tend to lean. But risk helps us paint a picture. It helps us tell a story about what's going on. It helps us present how much badness there is in security, right? So we can have discussions on terms with our business partners talking about security. Now, one of the nice things is that recently, the, the term risk is being used quite a bit, and so that's, that's good. It's kind of being talked about. The unfortunate part about that is I think a lot of people don't quite understand what risk is and how, and how to fully address it. So this is actually one of my favorite definitions of risk. This comes from a paper in 2009. It's, it's called A New Approach for Managing Operational Risk. It was written by a whole, it was a joint effort written by a whole bunch of actuaries and really, you know, technical statisticians and stuff. The report itself is based on the financial crisis and it's kind of from an operational risk standpoint, but I think a lot of the, the things within it are germane to security risk. So it's basically any, any deviation from the expected outcome. So I had an old, I had an old boss that, um, owned a couple of skate and board shops in Montana and Utah. And he would always put aside X amount of money every year for theft. That's not risk. He was expecting to lose a certain amount of money every year due to theft. Anything above that was risk for him. So another basic definition is, is this, and this is one I use quite a bit, where risk is really the convergence of three things. You need an asset, which is something of value. You need a vulnerability, which is some kind of weakness. And then you need a threat, something or someone to act upon that weakness and, and try to take advantage of that uh, asset. Now, an example that I like to use, because it's, it kind of relates things back to our personal lives, is, is our daily commutes, my daily commute, right? So every day I get in my car and drive to work. Now, based on empirical evidence that I've had uh, and collected over the years, I know that I should arrive at work within a given amount of time and that the probability of arriving there is near 100%. You know, I've, and I've got an asset, I've got my life, my car, things of value to me. I have weaknesses, my brake shoes, my tires, you know, my reaction time, things that are kind of weaknesses. I have threats out there, other drivers, the weather. So every day I get in my car, and drive to work. 
Well, there were several times this year that I'd get in my car to drive to work and it had snowed a foot. And so that expected outcome, that, that had deviated enough from what I expected that I decided to work from home that day. So that's just kind of a simple example of how we use risk in our daily lives. So risk is really about making a forecast. It's about trying to forecast something, right? And there's two primary components of risk, and we're all kind of familiar in them, with them in, in some aspect. And the first one is probability, right? It's that likelihood. It's the how likely is an event to take place? And we're all familiar with this on, on some level. If you, if you watch, you know, weather forecasting is a great one. If you ever see that there's a 60% chance of snow in the morning, that 60% chance is probability. You flip a coin 10 times, you know, six times it's going to end up snow. The other piece of that is impact, right? What's, what are we going to lose if that event happens, right? Uh, with weather forecasts, when they predict three to, five, uh, three to five inches of snow, that three to five inches of snow is impact. Now, when we're speaking to our business partners, that impact is typically dollars. We want to put it in dollar amount so that they can understand it because that's, that's real value to them. If we can forecast risk in real dollars, we can help them understand how important security is and how to prioritize and address security. Now, those two concepts together, we often see probability times impact equals risk, which really isn't the case, but it shows you kind of how they, they interoperate and how they work together. And we see something like this. This is a, a typical risk matrix that you see in a lot of the traditional ways of thinking, um, where you have impact and probability, and that gives you some kind of risk statement. The problem is, and, and I love this, if you, if you get a chance, that uh, document that I referenced a few slides ago is a great document and a great paper written, and it talks about some of the fallacies around this, but if you notice the red stuff, because we as humans inherently think something that's red is bad, is something that happens often and costs a lot of money. Well, that isn't really risk, that's called bankruptcy, that's bad business. If you've got an event that's happening quite often, and costing a lot of money, you're going to be out of business pretty quick. So really, risk looks something like this, where you're more worried about those high impact situations that don't happen very often, those black swan events, right? So this is actually one of my favorite uh, kind of s scenarios, ways to talk about risk. It comes from a company um, that I trained with several years ago called Risk Lens, and it's called the ball tire scenario. And it's really kind of getting you thinking about how much risk there really is. So if you think about, I want you to think about a ball tire. The tire's pretty bald, there's really no tread on the tire. The question is, is how much risk is there? Okay, now take that same ball tire and hang it from a tree with a rope. And the question is, how much risk is there, right? Now take that same tire, hang it from that tree with that rope, but that rope is fraying, how much risk is there? And then finally, you've got that same tree hanging from, or excuse me, the same tire hanging from the same tree with a frayed rope, but instead hanging over an 80 foot cliff with jagged rocks on the bottom, how much risk is there? The answer really is there's none, because who cares if an old dirty ball tire falls 80 feet down to a cliff, right? Now we as humans, and, and kind of our mentality, when we first think of a ball tire, we put it on a car, right? And we're concerned about the driver or those around him. And then as in some of those other scenarios, we picture a kid on a, uh, on a tire swing, you know, and the poor kid falls and breaks his leg. Or in the, in the last scenario, he falls 80 feet to his, to his doom. But the problem is there's no context around that. And this, this kind of goes back to that knee-jerk reaction that as security professionals, we a lot of times don't have a lot of context around security issues. We have a general con idea of security and what it might impact, and that's where we need to spend time with our business partners in working with them and getting to understand, really putting some context around security. So there's a couple, 
couple schools of thought out there around risk. The first is, is a very traditional concept and it's qualitative, right? This is where you add a label onto risk. Um, you see things like this, high, medium, low, green, yellow, red. I even saw this a few weeks ago, some, because there was some risk, right? So this is you're throwing a label onto risk. You're, which is a good start. Qualitative is a good start. And there's definitely some good models out there to, to begin your journey. If you're not familiar with risk, it's a good place to start. Um, but there's some challenges with qualitative. And one of the challenges that we often face is, is the idea of what, what does it mean, right? Something that's yellow to you could have different meaning than something that's yellow to me. There's a little different context around it, right? One of the other challenges that um, we face with qualitative risk is that it, it's sometimes hard to defend, right? If you tell somebody we have moderate risk or we have yellow risk, a lot of times that's just kind of a, a thumb in the wind type decision. And so it's hard to really defend that. So that's why I'm a big fan of quantitative risk, right? Quantitative risk allows us to put numeric values around things. It allows us to kind of talk on the same page. It allows us to, to have those, um, to have backing to some of our risk-based decisions, to our security decisions. So when we go back to talking probability, there's, there's several good uh, models and, and taxonomies out there and, and trainings out there to help you develop impact, or excuse me, pro, uh, probability. So you can start putting some numeric values around probability, right? And we're all, you know, we're kind of familiar with this if you, if you study floods you'll see things like a one in 100 year flood. All right, that's, that's a probability statement. Impact is a, little, is a little easier because we wanna throw things in dollar amounts. So our business partners, when we have discussions with our business partners, they understand dollars, right? When we're helping them make decisions around security, we're helping them by using dollar amounts. And there's, uh, actually we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but it allows us to help with put together a business case. We can help them prioritize and provide and, and secure funding for those risk, for those uh, security decisions. Uh, again, there's a lot of models out there with quantitative fares, uh, which stands for factor analysis of information risk, is one of my favorites, developed by Jack Jones. If you get a chance to look at it, it's a great quantitative uh, model that. It uses probability and impact. It uses its own taxonomy for it, but it's a great little model. Uh, uses very basic introductory statistics to put impact and probability in, in quantitative results. Um, I've also seen quite a few hybrid models, which is where you take uh, dollar values and then wrap it around a, a label. So you'll see things like moderate, you know, moderate impact might mean $1 million to $5 million, all right? And so what we do, uh, the, the place that I work and some of my uh, team members, some of the things we do is we do a lot of risk assessments when it comes to security work. Because in, in security, we are all risk managers, whether we think about it in those terms or not. So, and these, comes in all, these come in all different forms and... and um, of risk statements. So sometimes these uh, risk statements will be just a bullet point in a report. Sometimes they're a full report that goes up to the board or to executive management. But to think about it in terms of security, when a security vulnerability comes out, regardless of what it is, it could be something as simple as patch, you know, the most recent set of patches from Microsoft. Uh, it could be something, you know, that the media stirs up, you know, uh, where there's a, a vulnerability that kind of hits mainstream media and, and executive management wants to know about it. So the first thing that we do, kind of walking you through the mindset uh, of doing risk work with security, the first thing we do is kind of take a look at what it means to us. What systems are affected by it? How many systems are affected by it? We kind of get a lay of the land. Then we start diving into probability, right? 
which is where we start looking at the threats. Who's going to be attacking us? How are they going to be attacking us? Do you need the top tier of hackers to pull this off or can you know, a script kitty pull it off? You know, you start walking through uh, the controls that you have in place. How are we protected? That allows you to kind of put some probability around it of, all right, how susceptible are we to this vulnerability? And then the last piece of that is impact, right? So again, we try to put this into loss val values for our business partners so that they can understand it. But that is, all right, if we were to lose this asset, what's it gonna cost us? How much is it gonna cost us? And ultimately, what our goal is, is to help provide the business with some kind of decisioning, right? We want to help the business make a decision. Because in the end, a lot of us, not all of us, some of us, some of us are in uh, places of employment where security is our business, but a lot of us, we're not. And so it's our business partners that are making the money. And they've got different goals than we have. They have revenue growth, they have operation expenses that they want to decrease, right? And then here we are as a security group trying to tell them that they need to spend another $20,000 to fix something. Um, and that's not in their budget. They don't want to, right? But if we can put terms in, if we can develop a business plan, a business case for them, where we can tell them how much they're going to lose and what the probability of loss is, they can look at that and say, you know what, it's worth it. Let's go ahead and, and address this vulnerability, right? Now, there may be times when that's not the case, where maybe the case of implementing the control and operating the control is too much and it doesn't make sense to fix it. But we can help have those discussions and, and prioritize working with our business partners to prioritize security. And so really, as a security professional, that's... That's what we really are striving for, is this kind of nirvana where the world is full of unicorns and rainbows and everybody's happy and, and working towards the same goal. So one of the ways that we can get there is by changing the way we as security professionals think and the way we communicate and work with our business partners. If we can put things in terms that they understand, helping them understand it, in dollar values and realizing, giving security a place at, that, at the table, we can kind of change that discussion and hopefully, really our goal is to, is to kind of secure the organization, right? But if we do it in the right way, we can have this kind of utopia where us and our, our business partners, IT, marketing, whatever, are kind of working towards the same goal. So anyway, that's kind of my two cents, my rant on risk. Uh, if you're doing risk management work in security, great. If not, I would strongly suggest looking at ways to implement it. Uh, it'll help bridge some of those discussions. And so, anyway, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time today, and uh, I appreciate it.